Good morning. I was watching that on Nick, like right on his forehead, and I was like, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit. Otherwise, we're gonna be staring into the light on one. Yep, there it is. <laughs> speed up. There we go. Um, how many of you have perfect family dynamics? No? Not quite? Uh, maybe you've experienced some of this uh, just recently over Christmas and Thanksgiving, but none of us have perfect family dynamics. We wrestle with one another, right? And so we're going to be talking about some of that this morning, about family dynamics and this idea of wrestling. Um, and part of what we'll see in the biblical text this morning is that nothing has changed. In fact, maybe after this morning you will feel better about your family by seeing some of the family dynamics in the book of Genesis. Um, for me, it, my family has very much been revolving around wrestling this last couple months. Any other uh, wrestling families in the house? Yes, one? We got a lot of, getting a lot of, uh, is it too close to my face? Or is it too hot? Both. Both. Uh, my, my youngest son, Nathan, has been wrestling. Uh, last year he wrestled as a fourth grader, and so um, the, the way that that works is there's fourth, fifth, and sixth, and there's a JV and there's a varsity. And so in order to, to make varsity, as a fourth grader, he had to beat out a fifth or maybe a sixth grader. So last year he just struggled so hard because he wanted so bad to be on varsity. And this kid worked so hard and uh, he wasn't able to beat the sixth graders that were at his school. Uh, he was never pinned, but he, I mean, he just fought tooth the nail. So this year as a fifth grader, he was so determined to be on varsity. Well, as luck would have it, on his team is someone that weighs the same amount as him, and this kid was a district champion. So when it came to trying out for wrestling, they had wrestle-offs, and he had to choose. If he wanted to make varsity, he, he had a couple of choices. One is he could just say, you know what, I'm not gonna wrestle this guy, I'm gonna wrestle JV again, and that would've been a bummer. Um, and and my, if you know anything about my youngest son, he is stubborn and, and hard-headed and, and very determined, and so that was not an option for him. Uh, he could have wrestled this kid uh, and probably would have lost, and I think he, uh, he, you know, I, I don't know what would happen. But he did have two other options. One is he could cut weight and he could go down to the weight class below. The other was he could uh, either try to gain weight or just wrestle above his weight class. And uh, Jen and I really didn't want him to be cutting weight at this age. So he decided to wrestle above his weight class. And that was a challenge because he weighs 103 and he's wrestling in the 116 weight class. So at times there were kids uh, that were you know, 10, 12, 13 pounds heavier than him. So he decided to do that this year and he made varsity and he wrestled strong. Um, I think we have a, a picture of him. This is a picture of him uh, like full on throwing a, a sixth grader that's probably 10 pounds heavier than him. Um, and, and he had to learn, one of the things he had to learn it was breath control throughout the year. Um, he ended up making it to areas and we had kind of scouted out his opponents and talked about who we thought uh, he was gonna wrestle and we thought he had an easy path and so what ended up happening is his last match in areas, he had to wrestle a new kid that we had no idea how this, how this kid was gonna do against him. Um, and both Nathan and I had underestimated this kid. So if you know anything about wrestling, there's three rounds, one minute each, and by the beginning of the third round, Nathan was down 10 to three. He hadn't been pinned, but for all intents and purposes, he was beat unless something miraculous happened. Um, so here's how the match ended. He's the one in the gray. So you can see there's 
30 seconds left on the clock. He's down 10 to 3. running out on the mat. <laughs> he was a little bit pumped up. I still get like emotional just watching that video. Uh, but this morning we're going to talk about a text where Jacob wrestles with a mystery man. I don't know if you, you may be familiar with the text. Uh, you may have heard that, that uh, somebody say that Jacob wrestled with a man. Some say that Jacob wrestled with an angel. Some say that Jacob wrestled with God himself. Um, and so we're going to get to that text, but before we get to that text, we're going to back up and look at some of Jacob's family history and some of the wrestling matches that happened before that text. Uh, what I would love to do is, if I was preaching on a regular basis, is I would work through these stories until we got to this text and then it would be set up. Uh, but since we're doing this all in one morning, we're going to kind of fast forward through several of the matches in Jacob's history. So the theme this morning is going to be family dynamics and wrestling. Uh, so in the book of Genesis, we're going to take a look at kind of the family tree here. So if you look, uh, if you're familiar with the family tree, uh, Isaac marries Rebecca, and they have two tw twins named Jacob and Esau. And so the first match that we're going to look at this morning is between Jacob and Esau. The second match is between Rebecca and Isaac. The third is between Jacob and Laban, his father-in-law, who is also his uncle. And then uh, between Rachel and her dad, Laban, and then between the sisters, and then we'll get to Jacob and the mystery man. And I know that seems like a lot of matches, but we'll go quickly, I promise, this morning. Where uh, Doug, was, Doug was saying that he was gonna buy me lunch if I finished before 12, right? 12 o'clock? <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Genesis, but uh, we're really gonna be uh, We'll get to the text here shortly. Um, so there's all sorts of wrestling matches that happen in the text leading up to Jacob wrestling this man. And so it's important to understand the history of Jacob. And so if you, if you know, Jacob was a twin and he was born wrestling. The text says that he was grabbing onto Esau's heel as he came out of the womb. And interestingly, the Lord had told Rebecca that... Uh, that Jacob was going to be, even though he was the younger, that there was a prophecy that, that Esau was going to serve his brother. And so you can imagine they were growing up and that there was this like looming prophecy, right, that uh, as a younger child, you're going to rule over your older brother. And so the text tells us that there's this family dynamic, there's this tension that the father loves the oldest son, Esau, and the mother loves the youngest son, Jacob. And so there's this family dynamic with the prophecy and one loving one more than the other, right? And so one day, uh, Esau comes in from the field because he, the, the text says he's a hunter, and he ends up selling his birthright for a pot of stew. Not a very good uh, deal, if you ask me, right? And you would think, like, if, if, if he's the hunter and he's the bigger of the two, that he would have just been able to say, yeah, like, I know you gave me that stew, but like, I'm not really giving you my birthright. So there's this tension, this wrestling between the two boys. The second wrestling match happens between Rebecca and Isaac and they're wrestling over who their favorite child is. So as they grew up, there was this tension between uh, one loving the other. Any of uh, you willing to admit that you love one of your children more than the other? No. My kids joke about this all the time, right? They're always like, they're like, you know, well, I'll be driving with one of them and I'll be like, yeah, dad, you know that I'm really the favorite child, right? You know, and so they'll, they'll be talking. I actually saw a funny joke um, around Christmas time where this guy had uh, gotten a shirt made that said mom's favorite child. And he had tossed it in the gifts just anonymously, right? And it was, it was, uh, and so he, he, he had his, it was for his mom. And so his mom opens it up and it said, mom's, mom's favorite child. And it was the name of the son on the back, right? So, and she was like, I don't know where this came from, you know. 
But, you know, we, we like to say that we love our children um, equally, but in different ways. That's like the politically correct way to say it, right? If we're, but the text says, just very blatantly, uh, that the mother loved the youngest, Jacob, and Isaac, the father, loved Esau more. So you could imagine the family tension between these twins that was going on. And so the first wrestling match was the youngest son had won the, the birthright. And so the next wrestling match was over the blessing. And so what the Bible says is that Isaac was old and he couldn't see anymore. He was close to being on his deathbed, right? And so uh, Isaac sends Esau out, the hunter, to go and to get a meal so that he can be blessed. Well, Rebecca, the mom, overhears this and she grabs her youngest son and says, hey, we're going to sneak you into dad while he's on his deathbed and he can't see you and we're going to get you the blessing. <laughs> Right? So just imagine, like we've already got the tension between the boys, now we've got the tension between the mom and the dad, and she's pulling this trickery, just like Jacob has pulled this trickery in this wrestling match, and she's gonna get her youngest son a blessing as well. So she sneaks him in, and he's worried about it, and, and um, he comes in, he, he gets the food, and he gets dressed up like Esau, and he ends up being blessed by Isaac. And so not only does he steal the birthright, but he steals the blessing as well. And shortly after that, uh, Esau comes in, he comes into his father, and he says, like, I'm, I'm, I'm here to be blessed, and, and Isaac says, I'm sorry, I've already given my blessing away. And so you can imagine the disappointment, right, as he's lost both his blessing and his birthright. And it, you would think that, like, the father would be able to just go, okay, let's, let's bless you. Um, but he doesn't end up getting a blessing. And so there's, there's this twist that happens in the text. Um, and so as a result, the text says, to add to the family dynamics, that Esau hated his younger brother. You can imagine, right? Um, if you had lost your ble blessing and your birthright, that he hated his younger brother and that he was going to vow to kill him. And so the next wrestling match happens as Rebecca sends her youngest son off to her brother's house. So Jacob goes to his uncle's house, which uh, how many of you wanna, wanna send off your kid to marry their cousin, right? <laughs> this is, I mean, this, is, this, is, this is, gets real. I mean, this is just uh, what the text says. So he gets sent off to marry his cousin. So his father-in-law, Jacob's, uh, I think we have up there, the next one, match three. Uh, so Jacob gets sent to his father-in-law's house, right? And the text says that he falls in love with, with this girl named uh, Rachel, and she's very attractive. But the problem is, is she is the younger of two daughters. So again, we have two siblings. And the, the text says this is interesting. Um, it says that... Rachel was the younger one, and she was beautiful in form and appearance. Leah was the less attractive one, and it says something along the lines of um, she had droopy or lazy eyes, right? And it's this kind of like nice way of saying like she was the less attractive one, and she was she was the older one. Uh, and the Laban, the father-in-law, says, "Okay, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage, but you have to work for me for seven years." Uh, guys, how many of you would work seven years for your bride? <laughs> we, were, we were talking earlier in the back. I think there used to be uh, this old adage, right, that like the wedding ring was supposed to cost three months salary or something like that, right? Um, so even then, what's that, like maybe ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000, right? Jacob works seven years for Rachel. Seven years. She must have been smoking hot. <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. And the, te the text kind of fast forwards. And he said he's so much in love with her that the seven years went like days. Like it was nothing. He was, he, he was that much in love with her. And so, could you, I mean, just, I can't imagine working seven years to marry your bride. Right? And then, so everything is going great. And then on the wedding night, Jacob must have been drunk. 
the text doesn't say it, but what happens is Laban, the father-in-law, sneaks the older sister into the bedroom. And Jacob ends up sleeping with Leah instead of his wife. And so you wonder what happened there. Like, did Rachel pay, play a passive role in that? Um, or how that worked out. Anyways, however it went down, um, he ends up sleeping with the older daughter instead. And so he finds out in the morning, maybe when he sobers up, we don't know. And he's obviously very angry, right? If, if your father-in-law pulled the switcheroo on you on your wedding night, how angry would you be? Especially after seven years. Pretty bad. Right? <laughs> Pretty, yeah. Yes. yeah. So there's this crazy, there's this continuing theme of like this trickery, right, that's going on. And so what ends up happening is they negotiate and he says, okay, well, after a week, after you've been married uh, to, to Leah for a week, um, I'll give you reach Rachel as well, right? So he, he concedes a little bit, but he says, oh, but you're going to have to work another seven years for this woman, right? So they're able to get married right away, which is like some consolation, but Jacob works another seven years. And can you just imagine, like, Jacob's, at that point, has got to be so ready to get out of Dodge, right? Um, to take his take his wives and leave. Um, and, and just how the potential, like, hatred that he had for Laban. And so we have this text. We, we have the, this wrestling between brothers. We have a wrestling between a mom and a dad. We have a wrestling between a father-in-law and a son-in-law. And then the next wrestling that we see is between Rachel and her dad. So Jacob is getting ready to leave and take uh, his two wives and, uh, and his children and, and get out. Um, actually, let me go back. Sorry, I'm skipping one wrestling match. Uh, the, the next the next wrestling match is between the two sisters. Okay, so the sisters begin to wrestle um, over making babies, and so it becomes this baby making contest, right? Um, I can relate to this a little bit because I married a younger of two daughters, and we had the first baby on both sides of the family, right? Uh, and that first baby just happened to be that I had taken Jen, and we had moved halfway across the country and had the first baby on both sides of the family. So you can imagine the family dynamics that that created, right? The grandparents are here in California, we're living in Kansas, and everybody wants to see the first grandchild of the family, and we're all the way across, the, halfway across the United States. Um, this is kind of a, a similar thing, but the, so the women start getting in this baby-making contest, and Leah ends up having, having the first four babies. And so her younger sister gets obviously angry. And so she decides she's gonna solve the problem by giving her maid to Jacob. So now Jacob's got two wives and he's got a maid. And then the maid starts having babies. And so Rachel is like, this is, this is Rachel's response, which is an interesting response. Um, She says, with my mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. That's her summary of giving her maidservant over to her husband and, and winning. Like she sees, she sees that as winning. So then Leah gets mad. Leah says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the same thing. So Leah gives her maidservant, right? She starts having babies, right? So it's like, now Jacob's got four different women he's dealing with. Two of them are his wives, which are sisters, which are also his cousins. And then he's got, uh, <laughs> I told you, you, you feel better about your own family dynamics. This year. <laughs> I don't know if anybody in this room has married a cousin or if uh, they've been offered their maid servant of their wife, probably not. So he, he's dealing with this and it, it gets even more comical because uh, Rachel is, is wanting babies Leah is wanting babies, and the text says that um, that Rachel goes and she is asking for uh, this these mandrakes from from Leah. Leah's son had found mandrakes, 
And so she says, hey, give me some mandrakes. And Leah says, I'll give you some mandrakes for a night with Jacob, which tells you that she had obviously, she was controlling the nighttime business going on. Uh, so Rachel, who is in love with Jacob, it sells her, her rights uh, for some mandrakes. Sound familiar? What had Esau done with the stew, right? So she sells her night privileges, and then she goes and sleeps with, uh, with Jacob, and she ends up having babies number uh, nine and 10. So now they've got 10 babies. And then finally, Rachel ends up having two babies, and so Jacob's got four wives and 12 babies. So they, at, that, at this point, they decide to leave, and they're gonna go back uh, to where Jacob grew up. And so Jacob, obviously, with the family tension of his father-in-law, decides to get out of Dodge, but doesn't tell his father-in-law. So he takes his four wives, the 12 children, and all of, the, all of his uh, goods that he has, and he leaves. And so Laban doesn't find out until three days later. And obviously, uh, Grandpa's pissed at this point, right? Uh, this man has come, and, and there's also this interesting dynamic in the text where the wives are saying, hey, let's get out of here. Um, we don't owe our dad anything. He's sold us to you. And then when Laban finally catches up with Jacob, he says, what, why you've stolen my daughters? And so there's this tension in the text between uh, what, what uh, Laban thinks about uh, his daughters and what the daughters think about Laban. And so the, the next wrestling match is over the household gods. So at this point, they would have had uh, household idols that Laban had. And it turns out that Rachel stole the gods from Laban when they decided to leave, um, as if leaving and taking all of the, the grandchildren wasn't enough. And so when they leave, Laban catches up with them, and he says, hey, Jacob, what's going on? You stole my, you stole my daughters, you've taken my grandchildren, you didn't say goodbye. Um, and you also stole my household gods. And Jacob says, wait a second, I don't know anything about any household gods. If you find the household gods in my company, you can kill whoever took them. Not knowing that Rachel had taken them, right? So he's, he's, he's just put his, his uh, favorite wife on the hook. Like you can see the writing on the wall, she's getting ready. If, if he finds them, uh, she's gonna die. And so Laban looks and looks and looks, and then finally he comes to Rachel and so Rachel uh, decides to hide the household gods by putting them in a saddle and sitting on them. And so Laban comes in and he says, hey, Rachel, get up. I need to look in that saddle bag. And this is how she responds. She says, I cannot rise before you, for the way of the woman is upon me. So she, she claims her period as a way of not being able to get up from the saddlebags, hides the gods, and they end up getting away. So you see again a wrestling between a child, and uh, in, this, in this case, it's the, the child and her dad, uh, whereas previously it had been uh, Jacob and his parents. So all of this wrestling is going on as we, lead, as we, as we get up to the text. And there's all of this trickery going on and this family dynamics. <laughs> Um, and so we come to Jacob wrestling with this mystery person. There's also three things that, that we need to keep in mind as we get to this text. Uh, one is the fact that there's this continual theme of blessing going on, right? The, the blessing had been given to Abraham, and that's been passed down through the line. Um, and Jacob has ended up taking that blessing. There's this theme of identity where, where Abraham's identity was uh, changed when his name was changed as well. And then a third one that I'm gonna invite you to wrestle with this morning yourself, um, and I won't give you the answer because I don't have the answer, um, is that we don't know who this person that Jacob wrestles with. Uh, and, and part of that is understanding the idea of angels and gods in the Old Testament. So Jacob has three different encounters with angels and with God leading up to this text. Uh, one of them is his dream. The text says that Jacob had a dream in which he saw a stairway to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. 
Uh, he, he was called home by an angel, and God reveals himself in, at Bethel. And a, a third one, just uh, right before our text in Genesis 32, is that Jacob meets with uh, the angels of God in a camp. And so if we have the, uh, if we have the next slide, um, one of the things to keep in mind as we kind of wrestle with who this mystery man was is uh, this is kind of the breakdown of the, what's, what uh, scholars have called the divine council, okay? So the word Elohim is used for God or gods. Um, it's in Yahweh is the highest of the Elohim. Uh, Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you among the Elohim and Yahweh? For you, Yahweh, are highly exalted among all <laughs> Elohim. So there's this general category of spiritual beings that is Elohim, and Yahweh is the highest of the Elohim. But then there are other spiritual beings that we come encounter with, and here these, these are just three of them, right? So if we think about the good guys are the messengers of the Lord, and Malak uh, is is the word for messenger, and we typically think of that as like an angel. Uh, the Ben Elohim, the sons of God, and then the Shadim, which are the demons. And so the text says that Jacob wrestles with the man. But as we read through the text, there are interesting things that happen that a man couldn't do. Uh, and then later, Hosea 12.4 says that Jacob had wrestled with a malach, a messenger. So there's this tension as we read the text of, is it a man, is it an angel, or is it God? So here's what the text says. Then Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until daybreak. This immediately for me, like this, this raises questions of like, like Carl and I were talking, um, did, he, did he really wrestle all night? Like a three minute match just leaves you exhausted, right? Um, like, could you imagine wrestling for six, seven, eight hours? Um, the next verse says, when the man saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while they wrestled with him. And so the question is, if this is just a man, how does he have that kind of power? We automatically would assume that this is more than a man, that maybe it's an angel or maybe it's God himself. Then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, we see Jacob is continually striving for a blessing. He's already received the blessing from his father, right? But he wants more. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, which means wrestle with God. For you have contended with God and with men and have prevailed. So Jacob not only wins the wrestling match with his brother, and with his father, but also with this mystery man. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask of my name? And he blessed him there. So the man's identity remains hidden, while Jacob's identity changes through a name change. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen Elohim face to face yet my life has been spared. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over, and he was limping on his hip. Therefore to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the tendon of the hip, which is on the socket of the hip, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the tendon of the hip. So the question is, who is this mystery man? I think the author is inviting us to wrestle with the, the text and with that question. And that's one of the things that I love about the Bible. It's one of the things that, that I love that we do on Sunday nights, right? Is we wrestle with these life's big questions and we also wrestle with uh, different texts like the book of Jonah. And we're invited into the text to wrestle. 
And as we become Christians, we're invited to wrestle with God. Um, we obviously wrestle with each other, and we wrestle with God as well. And so um, it, as we walk with God, our entire walk is this process of wrestling with who God is, who God has called us to be. So very similar to this situation. Um, I think what we can see from this text is that what God is calling us to as we wrestle with God and with others. The text ends with Jacob meeting back up with his brother again, and they reconcile. Um, Jacob approaches Esau, and um, actually, let me just read it for you. But Esau ran to meet him, and they embraced him, and he fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And when Esau was lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, who are these to you, Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. And I'll skip down a little bit here. He's, uh, Jacob says, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of Elohim, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. You see, at this point, Jacob has changed. He's no longer striving with the blessing with his brother because his identity has changed because he's seen the face of God. Jacob re reconciles with his brother just as we are called to wrestle with others and reconcile with them. Um, I think what he says is, is very interesting. He says, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift for me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that I have received, now that you have received me favorably. I think when we truly wrestle with others and with God, what changes is that we're able to see God's face in others. And that changes the way that we deal with people. That changes the way that we, um, that we see them. Jacob recognizes that God has been gracious to him, and so he's then willing to offer grace to his brother. And so this morning, I want to do a couple things. One is just remind you that we are people that have been given grace. And so we're invited to see God's face in others. Um, there's no getting out of this wrestling match of life. We are going to wrestle with God and we're going to wrestle with other people. But we are invited into that. And how we wrestle matters. I'll leave you with uh, Hebrews 13.2, which is also uh, an invitation to wrestle with the mystery of this text and uh, just who Jacob wrestled with. Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospita hospitality to angels without knowing it. It's an interesting text to wrestle with. Fact that we may have encounters with angels on a day-to-day -day basis and not even knowing it. Um, I, had, I had an encounter uh, like that one time in my life uh, that I believe that that happened. Um, I was pastoring in Carson City, Nevada, and we had a arson fire, and so our sanctuary had burnt down. And uh, we had gathered as a community, as a church, to figure out what we were going to do next. Um, and so we were meeting in a room, and Carson City, Nevada is an interesting place to pastor uh, because uh, it's kind of a place where everybody goes and gets stuck. Um, so you, you have all sorts of the, uh, the biker gangs, and uh, prostitution is legal, gambling is legal, it's legal to carry a concealed weapon. It's really, really. It's really like the wild, wild west. And so you can imagine uh, the group of people that I was pastoring to in that moment. Uh, and I remember specifically um, me and, and my co-pastor just talking, going like, how are we going to lead these people 
out of this as like the whole sanctuary has, has burned down. Um, and I had a moment where um, I had an encounter with an, an older woman um, and all I can remember was uh, it was like tunnel vision had zoomed in and I was speaking to this lady and I can't even tell you what she said, but it was this moment of like comfort and she said that everything's gonna be okay, God's gonna take care of you um, and um, somehow like she like I she disappeared and I can remember asking all of these people afterwards like because I it was a woman that I'd never seen before and it was a small group like this so um, you know like I, she would have been she stuck she stuck out um, and it was just this, this interesting encounter of going did I just meet an angel that came to comfort me in this crazy time um, and I think that's possible. I think the, the text uh, talks about things like that. Um, but I just want to invite you as followers of Christ that we wrestle with this text. Um, and that's going to mean that we think about things differently throughout our journey. That's part of what we're doing on Sunday nights as we walk through Jonah and through Life's Good Questions. Um, but as we wrestle with God and with each other, remember that our God is gracious and that we're called to be reconcilers, and that we're called to see God's face in others. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these texts uh, that we get to wrestle with and your story. Um, God, thank you that uh, we can just see in these texts that um, as humans who wrestle with each other and strive, um, Family dynamics are all over the place. And so if we thought ours were uh, difficult or strange or awkward this morning, we can look back at this ancient text and see that not much has changed. Uh, the siblings still wrestle with one another. Mothers and fathers wrestle with one another. Uh, the sons wrestle with, with father-in-laws. The sisters wrestle with each other. Um, and God, sometimes we may even wrestle with uh, spiritual beings as well. God, I pray that you would give us uh, the strength and the endurance to continue to uh, wrestle through life. Give us uh, the courage to follow you, and thank you for your word this morning. Amen.